Hi, it's Laurie Tritchie here from Wood Solutions. Today we're taking a closer look at building acoustics, what they are and how we design for acoustics in timber buildings. Let's get into it. It's no secret that noise pollution is annoying, particularly when you're unable to escape it. Whether it's weekend DIY, road noise, or a loud TV loving neighbour, we're all occasionally bothered by noises out of our control. Multiple studies show the impact of noise pollution to building users, and the outcomes are more concerning than you might think. Research suggests that depending on the volume, frequency, and duration of the noise pollution exposed to, it can be linked to anything from mere annoyance, <laughs> to poor academic performance, hypertension, psychiatric disorders, and even potentially heart disease. It's clear that the effective acoustic separation of spaces within our buildings is not only important for our general quality of life, but it's also vital for our broader health, as well as successes in school, work, and play. So what does this mean for our buildings? And how do we design for a good level of acoustic performance? Before we jump into this, let's take a closer look at sound. Sound has two key characteristics that determine how it impacts your project and the users within it. Volume, or loudness, which is measured in decibels, and frequency, which is measured in hertz. I spoke to Amanda Robinson from Marshall Day Acoustics, who explained exactly what these are. So decibel is a measure of sound. You have 10 bells, which is a decibel. Um, and similar to the way we talk about light, we talk about dust we've got sound um, and it's a change of pressure. So you need a medium such as air, which can vibrate for sound to travel on. In terms of the change of sound levels and how the human ear hears it, we can't detect changes of one to two dB in the sound level. Um, you have to get changes of three to four before you start to notice it and a change of 10 dB is either a halving or a doubling of the sound level. The majority of us will always have some sound in our environment, but normally it's quiet enough for it to not be an issue. For example, this quiet office environment normally sits at around about 35 decibels, while the busy road outside might be closer to 60 decibels. Or at the extreme, a jet plane taking off can reach up to 140 decibels. Now we're clear on volume, let's take a look at the other defining characteristic of sound, frequency. Sound is broken up into different frequencies as well as an overall level. So when we talk about different frequencies, your, your doof doof music noise is typically around 100 hertz. Uh, speech frequency is around 1000 hertz. Birds tweeting outside is more like four kilohertz. Different frequency sounds have different sound waves. As this chart shows, lower frequencies form long, broad curves, while high frequencies give very short, compressed curves. At the extreme, wind turbines emit sounds below the human hearing range at roughly 10 hertz and can have wavelengths of up to 50 metres, whereas high frequencies, like the sound of birds tweeting, have wavelengths of 10 centimetres or less. This variety of wavelengths can make acoustic design complex, but there are a couple of simple rules we can apply to help us with our preliminary designs. Australia's National Construction Code gives minimum sound reduction performance requirements for all building classes. These requirements are typically broken into two categories, airborne sound reduction and impact sound reduction. So airborne sound is typically made up of activities like if somebody's playing the TV in an apartment or talking in their apartment, playing music in the apartment, um, that is not via speakers connected to the structure. <laughs> Uh, that is what we term airborne sound. When we're talking about airborne sound reduction, we're looking at the ability of a wall or floor to stop the transfer of airborne vibrations through into the space next door or downstairs. So if we had music noise in an apartment, at let's say 100 dB, um, and we measured sound levels of 50 dB in the adjacent apartment, you know, very simply, we could say that that airborne sound reduction between the two spaces is 50 dB. The basic rule of thumb here is that airborne vibrations are stopped by dense materials, so acoustic grade plasterboard or cement sheet linings can be really effective. Having said this, 
more sophisticated, multi-layered, lightweight build-ups can also work well. Note that there's also a CTR value applied to the airborne rating, which is normally negative. While your system might get an RW of 55, subtracting the CTR helps calibrate for performance against all frequencies and might result in a true rating of 50. Unlike airborne sound, impact sound is produced when you hit a hard surface, like when walking on a concrete slab in hard sole shoes. Impact noise in apartments in terms of the National Construction Code is a level of 62 or less. So the lower the impact sound level, the better the performance. If we think about apartments with carpet on the floor, you would expect the performance to be down in the 30s. Uh, whereas if you've got a hard flooring system like a tile or a timber board, um, you will find that you'll be, you know, mid 60s to 70s, depending on the type of underlay. And then if we look at a bare concrete slab, you'll find that the impact rating is 80. Now the performance in the building code is considered inadequate. A lot of acoustic consultants will not design to that as a level, but will go lower because there is such a prevalence of complaints if you design to the BCA. There is a body of work put out by the Association of Australasian Acoustic Consultants, also known as the AAAC, which sets uh, star rating guides for acoustic performance in apartments. And typically you'll find the higher the star rating, the better the performance. So if we did a comparison between what is in the National Construction Code and the AAAC guidelines, um, a force, the airborne sound reduction required by the BCA is around four stars, um, whereas the floor impact rating is around two and a half stars. To see how these numbers are tested for, I joined Marshall Day Acoustics on a site test at a recently completed timber project. Drawing on an education in physics and acoustic theory, these consultants use a variety of noise producing tools and sensitive microphones to test the acoustic insulation performance of wall and floor elements. Um, in terms of getting it right on apartment jobs, it's really important to consider every aspect and the devil is in the detailing when it comes to acoustics. So if you have very small gaps, if you think about if you've got a door ajar slightly and the amount of sound that comes through that as compared to the door shut you know that can have a huge impact on the sound production performance so getting those small details right are critical to the acoustic success of a project and you know really getting the advice early and upfront so that there is enough space and cost in the project to facilitate the acoustic design is also really important because if, you know, if it's in construction and you're coming across issues, it's very hard to resolve. Or even if after the fact, when everything's covered up, it is so much harder to go back in and fix those problems than if you do it up front. Thanks for watching. If you're interested to learn more about wood, wood products, or how to design and build with wood correctly, make sure to pop on over to the Wood Solutions website at www.woodsolutions.com.au. If you got something out of this video, please make sure to like it and share it with your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our future videos. See you next time.